I see we've got people in with us now. So uh, a little quick snapshot of our two guests there. Welcome back today. Um, so this is day four of our masterclass series. We've got one more day tomorrow. Um, so today is talent identification and scouting. Um, so uh, previously, Monday was psychology. Tuesday was uh, technical skill development. Uh, yesterday was physical development. And today we're looking at talent identification and scouting process. Um, again, this is uh, coming from the Dome Red Deer uh, and the, their football platform or soccer platform, the, the West Canada Soccer Academy. Um, this is uh, the fourth day now of us connecting Central Alberta with the English Premier League. Um, I'm really excited by our guest today. Um, as you know, this week we've really been trying to show the, the holistic aspect of long-term athletic development and how the Dome is really trying to bring that to, to Central Alberta. Um, and really interesting today, um, looking at scouting and talent ID processes. A um, couple of housekeepings. Uh, I noticed there's a few familiar people tuned in today, but for anyone new, um, please uh, mute your microphone and disable your video. All communication takes place via our chat. Um, so our guests, while they're talking and uh, discussing the topics, I'll be watching the chat and any questions that come up, I'll jump into the screen and, and introduce the, the question to our, our um, speakers. Um, and other than that, uh, it just now leaves me to introduce, first of all, the Dome's Alana Fitz. Alana is the Director of Sport and Operations for the Dome. She's going to be facilitating the discussion today. And I'd like to give a really warm welcome to our guest again from England, uh, is Tom Reeves. Tom is the head of UK and European scouting for Norwich City in the English Premier League. Um, I'm really excited to have Tom with us today. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Alana and I'll jump in and out as we go throughout. So over to you, Alana. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, right. Well, Tom, I guess we can just get right into it. Jason kind of touched on what your job title is. Could you just give us a little bit of background about yourself? Where did you come from? What are you doing right now? What's your so my, MO? My original background, I was uh, started off doing uh, youth coaching. Uh, so I was doing grassroots coaching. Uh, I had my own soccer school set up where it was basically just an introduction to football. It was ages four, five, and six. They would literally turn up, put them into small-sided games, and off you go, just go and play. They, they'd pay a small fee and it was off them. Um, I wouldn't do any sort of sessions. It was just an introduction to football. Mm -hmm. Then what we basically do is we'd, we'd select some players of putting them into sides. So it was my local club who I played for, which was St. George's. Um, they were the ones who funded the, the, the soccer school for me. And then what we do each year, we'd try and select maybe the best 10 and we would sort of pass them on an under seven and they would go and start playing football over the weekend. Uh, and one, I think it was my second year doing it, I was really fortunate to have 15 really strong players um, that I just really enjoy playing football. So they caught the attention of a few other people and then a, a guy from Burnley who was a close friend of mine just like, can I come down and have a look at some of the boys? Mm -hmm. so come down, watch watch a few of the sessions that we were doing, ones who were going into this uh, into the team, and he ended up asking all all fifteen boys to come into a local development centre in Liverpool. Cool. Um, I ended up going down with them, so I watched them all all train and do well. And then they asked me, did I want to come on board and did I want to be a scout and did I want to get involved in the development centre? Mm -hmm. uh, so ended up coming on board as, on a voluntary basis for. On two or three weeks, I think we we're on two or three weeks. Of a couple of players that were ready to come in, um, managed to bring a, a real strong footballer in from the Liverpool area, um, who's now doing really well at the football club, playing it, you know, under 15 football for England, and he's only 13 years of age. He's playing a year up for England, really? uh, and it basically, in the short, a short amount of time of working for Burnley, I managed to get four or five really good players to come up and travel from Liverpool to come and play. Mm -hmm because that was the area that I was working in. Based on getting them, them players in there, I caught the attention of Manchester United, uh, the, the dreaded Manchester United, because I'm a Liverpool fan. <laughs> but they, they, they were quite interested on knowing how I was getting these players to, to, to travel to the hour, the hour and a half to Burnley. You know, and, and they had a chat with me and asked me whether I come work for them in the Merseyside area. So I, um, I left Burnley Football Club and I went to go and work for Manchester United. 
Uh, I spent a year there where I was looking at predominantly the young, we call it the pre-academy age, mm -hmm. under seven and under eight, so seven, eight years old. And it was looking after players in the Merseyside area that we'd bring in. They would come to our session for a little bit and then the better players would be moved on and they would go on to go and train at Manchester United's training ground. So I spent around a year at Manchester United getting some strong boys from Merseyside in and then I got a random phone call out of the blue. Uh, it's my current boss now at Norwich, who I'd never met before. He's worked with Jason for a long time. Um, and he just called me up out of the blue and said, can we have a cup of coffee? Can we, can we meet? Can we get together? I said, mm -hmm. No problem yet. So I went and had a cup of coffee with him and we sat down and he was naming the names of players that have been coming in. He'd just come back from uh, Wolves where he'd worked and he was asking how I was getting these boys to travel and you know how I was managing to get these boys to come up to Burnley and how I was doing at Manchester United. So he initially asked me whether I'd come back part-time. But uh, I, I felt that leaving Manchester United to come back to Burnley was probably not going to be uh, something I wanted to do. I wanted to try and build my way up. But then he offered, he offered said, well, OK, how about you come back full time? Mm -hmm. Something I could definitely not turn down with, you know, when I was only working on a part time basis. So I snapped his hand off and uh, I, went in, I, went in, I went in to work for Burnley where I was um, given the title of Academy uh, Recruitment Officer. Mm -hmm. So I basically looked after the whole system between the age of nine to 16. But then after around, I think it was around a month's time, I, I took on the young ones as well. So I was basically mm -hmm. doing from under seven all the way up to under 16 as well. Um, can you just explain that or just maybe go into it a little bit more, the talent identity recruitment you said? So yeah. you said you're working with kids who are from under six and seven years old to yeah. 18. Um, can you just tell us, because it's, it's maybe a little bit different in Canada, especially in central Alberta, than it is in England. Can you just explain that process? Yeah, so the, the very young players, you, you're under seven and you're under eight, they, they, would, they would come into like a, a development centre in the local area. So we had, I think we had three sets up, one in Manchester, one in Liverpool and one in Burnley. Mm -hmm. So the three, the three satellite centres, as we called them, they would come into there and then the stronger players would come up to Burnley and they would train twice a week. At the end of uh, the, the year that they would be turning nine, they would sign a contract with the club. Players um, nine and upwards, up to yep. 16, we would predominantly look for just grassroots players. Burnley yep. is, a, is, a, is a fantastic football club, but not a club that wants to invest on uh, spending money on other, on other academy players, if that makes sense. I'll, I'll touch on that later on, what, what we can do. So my mark would predominantly be the grassroots area. We were allowed to recruit from the ages of nine to twelve. We're allowed to recruit within within one hour. Um, there is a little bit of a loophole where you can get one hour and six minutes, which I would use one one thousand percent because it, it made six minutes would make a huge a huge uh, difference for me to recruit. Um, so we, by that you mean they would they the 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 kids are allowed to travel within one hour and six minutes of their hometown to play somewhere else. So how it would work is when you would register the player before they come in, you would have to calculate on Google Maps how long their journey would take. When you yeah. registered the player as a trialist, as we called them, yep. the, the, the county FA would also check if it was over the hour and six, they weren't allowed to come in, uh, yeah. even based on real time. There'd be ways that we could get around it, which there was ways that I had to do it because you have to get these boys in. Yeah. Um, that would change. So between the ages of 12 or upwards to under 16, you're allowed an hour and a half or an hour, an hour and 39. You're allowed 10% over, which was a bit of a secret unwritten rule. Again, I would use it definitely to my advantage to make sure that the boy in the other side of Manchester you know, would have to sit in the car for an hour and a half. I would make sure that I've got that extra nine minutes to get them boys up that there. That they can travel to him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I basically looked after that, bringing in a lot of players from different age groups, more so younger players than, than around the, the, the under 14, 15, 16. We would predominantly look for players in them age groups that were released from the bigger clubs. So say Manchester United, Man City, Liverpool, Everton, they would release them players. We, we'd look to compete with other teams around us and bring mm -hmm. them in. Uh, mm -hmm. The clubs in England are categorised. I think we spoke about this the other day. Yep. So... Burnley, unfortunately for them, uh, were a Category 3 club at the time. 
and around them was Liverpool, Manchester United, Everton, Manchester City, Blackburn, who are all cap one. Mm-hmm. So they can attract fantastic footballers. Blackburn is is a massive club that's within driving distance of Burnley of 15, 20 minutes. They've won the Premier League. They could recruit the best players in the area. We yeah. would have to compete with that. But I also found the niche of competing with the bigger clubs in Manchester and Liverpool. So I tried to make Burnley the next attractive option if you weren't quite the one for them clubs in Merseyside and Manchester, which I had a lot of success doing, to be honest. Um, Hence why I'm I'm sitting in this chair today. Um, Later Um, on, after after Jason moved on, my role changed and I predominantly just looked after the foundation phase age group. So I looked after the pre-academy. I was the head of the pre-academy and I was ahead of up to nine to twelves. It, it was just a real large role doing six to sixteen. So diverse, and having to do that much paperwork, they decided to bring somebody a bit of an older head in to do them older ones. So I just right. did nine to twelve or six to twelve, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking for those ones. Just make it a little bit, make your time a little bit easier, spend it more efficiently, kind of thing. Um, just. So for everyone, or can, I guess, can you explain it to me? You said there's that Burnley is a category three club um, and that you can recruit players who are young, as young as six, seven, eight, nine mm-hmm. years old. And then, so what's the process if I'm a young player and I'm in a category three, how can I move up to the category one? Or um, you actually talked about how you were looking for the grassroots players. So can you just talk yeah. about the process of how you would identify those players for either category one, two or three? club kind I'll of like touch, just ex- what that I'll touch, process I'll touch is. on the categories for you i'll go through the categories so there's, there's four categories basically the, the category one are your elite premier league clubs but i'm probably your elite championship clubs now i think there's around 23 24 category one clubs in the country and that basically entails that the kids get so many coaching hours. i'm just going to turn the light on two steps it's just got a little bit darker um it basically entails that they get the most elite coaching and they get more coaching hours and things like they have a day release program where they'll not go to school for the day they'll come in and train. But that that's probably a little bit older. That's around under 13, under 14 age groups. But it's basically down to to funding and facility. The Cat One Clubs have the best facilities. They'll have an indoor pitch, you know, 15, 16 outdoor pitches. Category is a little bit different. You'll probably have around eight outdoor pitches for one per age group. You'll have an indoor facility, but you probably won't be able to um, work on the capacity that the, the, the bigger clubs can. If you're a Category 3 player and you want to move to a Category 1 club, it, it can only be done if the Category 1 club pay a fee. Crazy. So each year, after you sign a contract at under nine, yeah. the length of time that you're at your club is £3,000 per year. So we're under nine to under ten, £3,000. Nine, yeah. it's uh, ten to eleven six thousand pounds and it goes up each year until yep. the age of uh, under 12 and then each year after that it trebles so it goes from 12 to 36 and blah, blah and vice versa wow if i was a category one scout if i work for manchester united i could go into a category three club and scout their players yep. i'd have to probably watch them a good eight nine times go back to my club and put him forward and say this boy has got a lot of potential i feel he's definitely better than or as strong as some of the players we've got in our group we can we approach Burnley we would have to pay a fee we would have to pay a, a coaching fee it's basically it's a fee to compensate the the, co- uh, the, the coaching hours that he's had right. so we would compensate the club based on different things and, the, and if a player's been offered a scholarship at the age of 14 which you can offer or a pro that fee can be astronomical so you can get some of these cat one clubs paying yeah, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds for players at fifteen, sixteen. Wow, that's absolutely that's astounding. So then, I mean, you sell this is, and these are your words exactly from when we spoke the other week. You kind of self tell yourself as a bargain hunter. Yeah, that's so, that, that, definitely what I am. I've been a two club. The club that I'm currently working for now, Norwich, is exactly how we work, but at Burnley as well, especially working in the grassroots. It was needle and haystack work. Looking for that little gem that, you know, probably wasn't going to be on par with what was in the building, yep. but, but could be better, you know, could be or, or, or even more. I'm really fortunate. The grassroots in Liverpool is incredibly strong. 
and grassroots in Manchester is also incredibly strong. And I had a club that was within an hour of it, and I got to tap into that market. Yeah. Because they were so strong, those two big clubs in them areas couldn't recruit all them players. So I had the niche of being able to slip in there and go and get them players, which I did do. I took full advantage of it. So you would find the, you would find the grassroots players that you, the diamonds in the rough that are really talented, and you'd bring them to you for, for no cost kind of thing? No cost. No cost. They would literally come in for a six-week trial. So a six-week trial entails they, they have to leave their grassroots club. Yep. There's an agreement between you and the grassroots club that they can come in for six weeks. And the agreement is you might not get them back. <laughs> they might come in. They would, if they're good enough for us, we'll offer them a contract and we'll sign. We don't have to compensate the grassroots clubs. Sometimes you can give them a bit of an agreement, a bit of a sweetener where you'll say, you know, we'll always invite you in for games and we'll give you a tour of the training ground and a lot of them things. Some clubs are great, some clubs aren't. You know, you get a lot of clubs that want to win a plastic trophy and put it up on the wall. Some clubs really want to push their players to go and play in academies and, and they're really happy for you to go and do it. Yeah. Um, it's whether the manager wants to uh, have all the glory and have a trophy on his fireplace or whether he wants to go and produce players for, for academies. It's... It's a real split. Um, yeah, um, I just, for me, this just seems, um, it seems like it's really similar to Central Alberta where we have, we don't necessarily have really a lot of clubs or big city centers. It's just kind of smaller counties and we have all these players with a lot of talent, um, mm -hmm. but they're just unrecognized. So in, what would you look for when you would go out and you watch these kids play and you're, you're watching these grassroots levels athletes doing whatever what are you looking for in that or like what's a what's something that you know that you're like oh, i want these players to come and play at a higher level it really does change i've wrote down here like younger players we, we were talking about to do today especially in younger players it's more attribute based you're looking for can they run can they run quickly are they strong you know what are they like with the ball and, and it's looking it's looking for attributes more than it is quality because quality hasn't been developed yet and there is a big difference uh, between att an attribute and quality. Yeah. You are looking at those players based on can you bring them into an environment and can you can you make them attributes into a quality? Now, a quality for me is something that impacts a game. Can can that quality that you've produced impact the game? Can that lead to them you know, going on to be a professional and, and winning the game? That, that's how I look at it. So with, in the very, very young players, it's basically attributes from, I'd probably say from around the age of six to around 11, probably attributes. A little bit older, as I say, because the grassroots are so strong in, 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 in England here, where I'm from, it would probably be looking to see if they've developed any qualities through their coaching. Mm -hmm. If I was in Canada, it would be looking for the same thing, probably half and half attributes, and then players who are showing that quality that can affect games. Yep. Are they winning games? Are they making good decisions? You know, are they just running straight lines because they're a sprinter or can they go both ways around the defender? You know, have they got end product? Can they get into them advanced areas and can they can they cross the ball for their striker to score? You know, it's things like that that, that we're looking for. And in older players, is very, very different because your club has a philosophy. Mm -hmm. so your club will have a certain type of player that they look for in a certain position. So my job now at Norwich, we have a club philosophy. It's, it's, it's brought in by the sporting director and our manager and they have a, a criteria that they look for in each position. Yep. So we would look for qualities that they could bring to our start in 11 because we're there to win. Younger players are not there to win, we're there to develop. So we're looking for can we develop the qualities. Older players are looking at can we bring players in to buy to improve our first team for us to win games. Simple as that. Yeah, um, I was... Um... I was going to ask if you could explain or maybe just challenge you a bit on the when you're looking at younger players, you're looking for attributes um, yeah. just because maybe in an eight, nine or a 10 year old, like they haven't hit puberty and they're, they're still growing and there's still a lot going. So how can you find an attribute in that that young of a player um, versus maybe a quality like I just that like what's the or have you found any challenge around that or kind of what are your thoughts on it? It's a real good question. That's a difficult one. I don't know what it is. It's just something I, I, I we were talking about today. I call it the spark moments. It's just something that I, that's in my head goes, oh, well, oh, you've caught my attention now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm fixated on that player. And especially at the young grassroots age, it, it wouldn't even be watching the game. I would literally solely focus on that player. The second they did something that I liked, so an attribute or that little glimmer of quality, 
I, I'm watching you for the rest of the game. I don't care what the score is. I don't care if the goalkeepers get the ball away. I'm literally watching you. And then it'd be things like, I've, I've wrote down here, things like a half time when the coach is speaking to them. Are they listening? Are they taking the information on board? If they have taken the information on board, are they going back on the pitch? And are they applying that into their game? Yep. Are they affecting the game with, with mm-hmm. what's been told? Mm-hmm. And even things like situations. So how are they reacting to situations in the game? If they've got a goal down, are they determined to go and you know, make an Get impact and try and bring that goal back level? Or you know, if, they've, if, they've, if they've gone ahead so many, are they, are they rallying around? Are they looking to keep possession? Are they looking to go and score again? Just, just little things, little cues like that are things that we look for, especially in the younger players. Yeah. It's hard for me to define that spark. It's just something in my head that goes, you, you've caught my attention now mm-hmm. and I'm fixated on you. It's something I'd love to be able to write about in the future that I'll be able to put into words, but I think I'll be able to sell that for a lot of money in the future. Yeah, if you, could, if you could really nail that down, I think a lot of coaches would pay lots of money, good money for that. Spark moment, yeah. For me, it, the, the spark moment, um, I guess, is how if I... So I grew up in central Alberta and then I ended up having to move away to go pursue sport at a higher level because I felt like I wasn't getting seen or I wasn't getting noticed. And um, I don't know if much has changed around central Alberta because I actually just got moved back here, luckily enough for this job. But if there's any advice you could give for kids who are kind of growing up in these areas where potentially there's not many scouts or you don't know when you're going to get seen, but you want to demonstrate that spark so you get noticed, like what, what would you tell those kids if you if you're going up to their game and you want to see the spark like what should i do as a player to get noticed kind of thing the, the the difficult thing is in england is players are always prepared that scouts are going to be there because there's so many of us we're always looking for talent the biggest thing that i would say to players in canada is always play as if somebody's watching mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're the invisible men we stand away from everybody else or we hide in the, in the crowd and we, and we make sure that we don't want to be seen. The only time we're seen is at the very end when we go over and we shake hands with the coach and we ask permission to speak to the parents. Right. That's, it's as simple as that at the young age groups. If, I, if I'm a young player in Canada and I don't know if there's any scouts there, I don't have that mentality. Always have the mentality that someone is always watching you. Right. Always. Because what, at one day that you, you don't believe that, and that scout's mm-hmm. there maybe coming to see you and you have an off day, it's 50 50 yeah. the biggest thing i would always say is oh whatever the game is whether it's training a prime example i came to canada last year mm-hmm. and they probably prime their players to say look it's a big trial event and everybody's coming they might not have done if 12 of us walked in from different clubs last year you know those players were, were ready you know they were ready for us to be there they were given their all because they knew there was an opportunity for them to come to europe and come play that would be the biggest thing that I would say to players in, in Alberta. It is really difficult because it's so spread out. We're, we're, we're like this in, in, in the UK, and especially in my area, the Northwest, there's 12 to, 15, you know, 12 to 15 professional clubs that all have scouts that are all competing for players at grassroots. And, and it's players are always, always ready, always prepared, because they just never know who's watching. And that would be the biggest advice I'd give to, if, if, you know, in the dome, Train, train like there's always someone watching because yeah. you just never know. Jason might have invited somebody there. Jason might invite me there next year. Yeah. And train, you're still trying to bring people over. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm, I'm just jumping in there because he actually stole my thunder. I was about to say that is sometimes it's not the scout that's in attendance, but it's the network of people and me, myself, using you as the example in our programs and 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 actually that there's one or two players in in the dome soccer programs that that have really impressed me and and. Um, I've already mentioned them to people I know in in my network. So it's not always whether there's a scout in attendance or not, but actually the network. And and for me, using you as an example, I'll pick the phone up and say, Tom, by the way, there's, there's this young girl, this young boy in, in my program. And, you know, I think you should be aware of them. So it's not always necessarily the scout in attendance, but the communication we can have and and I can speak to whether it's college coaches or yeah. whether it's scouts at professional clubs, coaches mm-hmm. at professional clubs, and, and, and make these people aware of what's in our, what's in our kind of program in terms of, of, of ability. So um, I'm just echoing what you said, to be fair. I jumped in and then you, you stole well, my word. Word of, word of mouth is the most powerful thing in grassroots football. 
in, in England, especially in the Northwest. It's, it, you know, other scouts talk, well, have you seen so-and-so at a, you know, yeah. a Bootle Vipers? No, I've not seen him. Oh, get over there and go and see him. You know, and you get over and go, wow, how have I not seen him? But it, it, it's, it's, it's loads. It's loads. It, uh, as I say, the, the biggest thing, to your players, Jason, when you're coaching them out, that, that's the biggest thing I would say. Train, train like there's always somebody watching because you just yeah. never know. You just never know. They could be anywhere. Um, anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. I've done, listen, I've done it myself. There's, we have an, there's an open trial event here in the UK. It's called UK Trials. And um, it's a great story, to be honest with you. I, 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 went, I, I normally went early, and this goalkeeper turned up really early. Now, how it normally works is there's a session in the morning, then the goalkeepers train, and then the goalkeepers go and train with the session in the afternoon. So this goalkeeper had turned up early and he didn't really know what to do and they just sort of said, I'll oh, just take part in this session early. Within five minutes I'm looking and going, oh wow, who is this kid? Crazy. So I'm like, I've not, I've not made eye contact with anybody else. I'm fixated on this goalkeeper going, this kid is like far better than what we've got at this age group. Yeah. You know, we can bring him in. He's not going to cost any money. You know, within seconds I'm looking around going, who's mum? You know, who do we need to speak to? I was onto it straight away before anybody else was. I was straight over to mum. He'd been there five minutes. What's his name? Can he come in next week? You know, we'll sort it. Bang done. He was in at Burnley the next night. We signed him two days later. Brilliant story. He then went on to go and play for England six months later. Wow. The boy, the boy was playing grassroots in Huddersfield. It, it was that that spark moment, you know. And the boy had signed up to go to the open trial, but he was, you know, when I was talking to him at training, he was like. I just never expected this. You know, I thought I might come and, you know, I don't know, I'd have to come and pay and play again. You just never know who's watching. And you've yeah. got to be proactive as a scout to just go, boom, I've got to get you in now. I'm, I'm bringing you in. And then get in there. And I, I think it's really interesting that the player um, wasn't, like, he wasn't trying or anything like that. It was just a natural, he was just doing his thing. And you just saw it. And I think that speaks a lot for young athletes. To get noticed, you don't have to try really hard to impress people. You just have to do what's natural and is best for you. And you'll get seen. You'll put yourself in the right places. Go to those open trials. Take the opportunity. And then the coaches will see you as long as you're playing. And I think that's just really – that really resonates with me because it reminds me just as a coach that there's players everywhere and it doesn't matter where you are. You have an opportunity to, to pull them out and to move them into a higher level of sport. I've always found as well – I've recruited a few boys in my time at Burnley where they've not necessarily been the best player in their team. Mm -hmm. Some of the best players have got the bravado of look at me, how good I am. And some scouts don't want to go near that. And then you're looking at, like what I said before, who are the ones who are listening at half time? Who are the ones who are taking it on board? Who are the leaders? Who are, who are making the other players play well? Can you come into Burnley and make our players play well? Done that plenty of times. I'm, you know, and then they're the ones who kick on and go and be the stronger players in, in, in the teams in, in your academy. Yeah, I, that, I once had a coach tell me that. Um, the best players are the one that make their teammates look good, right? Um, I mean, you can score the most goals, you can do the best, but it's like you said earlier, what do you, how are you taking the coaching advice at halftime? And what are, you, what are you doing in the shadows when nobody else is watching to set yourself apart and to make your team look good? I think that's just really, it's just really, it's a really powerful thing to remember that as a young athlete or as a parent of an athlete, it's not all about scoring all the goals or doing everything perfectly. It's about doing the little things that, Coaches notice, but that scouts notice as well, because like you and Jason were saying, coaches communicate and there's a big network of communication and we're always talking about what's going on with the players. And it's not just who scores the most goal, it's who's turning up early, who's helping clean up all the balls. It's the little things that are really important. Some great examples there. And they're, yeah. the, ones that, and they're the ones that the coaches want to put even more time into. They're the ones that they want to develop even more because they are great kids as well. Yeah. Listen, there's so many kids that you come across who've got unbelievable talent, but their support mechanism behind them isn't the best. And then, and then the kids' attitudes aren't the best. They think they're going to make it already at, you know, 11, 12, and, and they're not necessarily the ones that go all the way. Yeah. It's the ones who've got the best attitudes, who want to, who, you know, who want to listen to the team talks, who want, to, who want to improve the players around them as well. And we yeah. certainly look for things like that, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to take a qu just a veer off on the other side we kind of talked a lot about the players um and an important part about youth athletes and young players is the parents because you you can't get to your games you can't get your practices until you have your license or a vehicle without your parents so um do you have any advice that you'd give to parents who if they're 
their child is really excited and wants to pursue something more, is there anything that you would like to share with them? I think this is something that I touched on a bit earlier. So when I when I first started doing the coaching, I've gone away and done all my hours and gone and got my qualifications and gone and got a degree. And, and my my sort of my sort of philosophy was that you, you dropped your kid off at the door. And the reason I had that philosophy was is because it's their game. And it's their game and they're there to be happy. Happy players improve quicker than happy players. Listen, we had it in the UK where, you know, you can walk to a grassroots game and you've got 12 parents barking orders on, you know, and, and overseeing the coach and all that. And it's just not healthy for players at all. Yeah. If I can give any advice, you know, things like you were asking me the day, what, you know, what do you say to your players in the car? The first thing that I would say to my boy, yeah. the second he walked off the pitch would be, did you enjoy that? Yeah, that's it. That's all. That's the first question. Did, did you enjoy it? And then they go, yeah. What did you enjoy about it? And then maybe, you know, just have a conversation with them. Okay, what do you think about this? Listen, it's probably really difficult for some parents that haven't got that background of football or soccer behind them as well. I understand yeah. that. But if your child's happy, they're going to improve a lot more yeah. than, than, than an unhappy child is. It's, I, and I really don't mean in a patronising way of just drop your child off at the gate. You, you guys are so fortunate to have an outstanding coach like Jason Blake and the organisation that he's going to have there is going to be unbelievable. You know, once everything's up and going, and going again. And it literally, it, 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 to get the best out of your boys and to get the best, like Jason, get the best out of your boys, have that attitude of, off you go. There's, there's the white line, cross it, right. off you go, it's your pitch, you go, you, go and, you go and do what you need to do. Yeah, let them play, let them train, let them play with Jason, stand over there as a parent and then you can come and talk about it after. Um, what about, like, what about the, any sort of the traveling concerns type thing? Have you ever, have you ever faced that? Has anyone asked you, like, well, we, like, we really want to play, but we just don't think we can make the travel work in our schedule? Like, what, do you have any advice for that? I think it's really difficult because your country is so, so big. So we were discussing <laughs> the other day, you know, you have, you can have an hour and a half drive, two hours to, the, the local that, that's your local training ground yeah. in England you know I look out my window and there's four grassroots teams within my within a mile of my house you know there's a school there that has training on every night there's another school there it's it, it just how it works yeah. the biggest thing that I would say about travel is it's going to set you up for life what does a footballer do right. travel they play yeah. home one week they play away the next week you know traveling from Norwich, where my club is based, is six and a half hours from where I'm. I work remotely, so I live in Liverpool. It takes me six and a half hours on a train to get to Norwich, or a, four, or a five hour drive. It might seem absolutely nothing to you guys, but it's just something that we have to do. And in the Premier League, which is the biggest league in the world, the Championship, the, one of the strongest leagues in the world, and players on the road, you know, going away to away games. I know it might be difficult sitting in a car to go to that, but it will set you up for life being used to travelling. Right. You know, using your time in the car as well could be even better. Just moving back to the, the parents thing as well. Maybe just asking the right questions and having the conversation. You know, are you enjoying the game? What 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 do you feel you can improve on? Is the things we can ask Jason that you know we can sort of do in, in the car? Maybe some players don't. You know, it's 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 weird as well. My my, my missus is um, brother was a pro. He come through at Liverpool. Didn't like talking about the game. Wait wait wait. Sorry, he was a what? He was a pro. He played for Liverpool. He was a pro. Oh, a pro. I thought you said a pro. And was, I was just your accent. He, did, he, just pro. Didn't like, he just didn't like discussing the game. He was a professional, sorry, yeah. He didn't like discussing the game. He just liked being in the zone and he liked to do it his way and that was the way it is. But yeah. all, all players are different. You have to cater for them, don't you? And, 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 uh, it, it's so difficult for me to give parents advice because I'm not, I'm not one yet. And I'm going yeah. to experience that myself. But I, my, my mentality is going to be there's the white line. You're with a professional now. You know they're gonna they're gonna go and coach you and do the best they can do for you. Yeah. Um, one thing that we, you had mentioned before earlier when we talked previously is that um, if a kid is desperate enough to be a professional, then why would you jeopardize their opportunity? Do you think you could just expand upon that a little bit more? Just any like any thoughts behind that? Um, In terms of the better players, you've got that bit of the chip on the shoulder. You mean is that? Or, is that what you mean? Just, just any player that's that's looking. They, anyone who's a bit concerned about, I don't know if I should pursue a higher level of sport. If I should put my time into it, um, just 
if they're desperate to be a professional, why would you jeopardize any training opportunity that they had? Like, do you just have any thoughts on that? That was just, that's just something that you had said to me um, previously when we were talking about the parents um, and talking about families and just like traveling long distances. And maybe, maybe, maybe there's someone who's out in central Alberta that, that doesn't want to travel to Red Deer to train at the Dome, but you know that their kid has a special spark. So how can we give them more opportunities to succeed? I'm just kind of, that's a direction. We, we, uh, yeah, we, we touched on maybe like the, uh, the open trial thing, didn't we, that, that I talked about that I did. Yeah, we were talking about that. So that, that could be an yeah. interesting one where it's so difficult because you, your travel time, you don't have a set travel time like I had to work to, but something I did as well, just to broaden my, you know, because it's so big yeah. around, because there's so many clubs, we did like an open trial thing where they could just come and go. Um, they came on. They came on one night. I think I got uh, 110 players. I think I brought in. That's just off an advert from Twitter, where I just basically said, "Look, we can't see everybody. Why don't you come to us and we'll we'll, we'll take a look at you?" I think we ended up taking in. I think I said 16 in on trial for one age group, which was unbelievable. I think we ended up signing eight, which was you know to bring 110 players in, you get eight players out of it is is, is massive as well. Yeah. I think it's so difficult as well for younger players if they haven't got that support. Right? It's, it's not every, some parents go to work all day and at five o'clock they might not want to drive two hours to go and train. It is really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, it's tough for me to get that, that advice for them, for them young players. If It's hard now because you aren't as advanced as us yet. And I say, and I say, and I say yet, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. It's such a huge country. You know, you could, you could surpass us and... 10 years time where you've got a local club on every corner do you know what I mean and it's it, there's a great question that's just come up there yeah. that I've just seen that, just um, to answer that's that's a question that Keenan was asking is a family's income ever an issue when scouting talent something I mean, that we've done, something that we've been able to do in England, we've only really done it with one player when I was at Burnley, is we can, we can, we can help out. Yeah. If, if the player is an absolute special talent, you yeah. know, we can help out. You can't induce the players. It's very, very difficult to induce the players because it's, it's against the rules. You can sort of bend it a little bit where you can go, okay, we'll make Dad a scout and we'll, we'll look after Dad that way type thing. I never, ever take parents in coming to, you know, it's never something that puts me off. If that player is a good footballer, we'll do whatever we can we'll ask yeah. you know we'll ask another player if they can bring them in like if they can help out and just little things like that i mean it's difficult because you really want to get them players in yourself and if i could drive them in you know it could do but like child safety and protection and stuff it's something you couldn't do um we were there was there was a real big discussion that we had at Burnley where we were looking to put on a minibus service okay so it was basically getting a minibus into merseyside uh, and we would pick a select amount of players that were struggling to get to training, and then we would bring them up, and then vice versa, the minibus driver would take them back. Difficult with the funding. Could be a great idea in the future, maybe that, if, if that's something that the, the parents are struggling with, maybe it could be uh, something that's looked into. Just like a, like a carpooling type of bus? Is yeah, that what exactly. you mean? Yeah, exactly that. And, and it was something I tried to discuss with younger age groups where I said, is it possible, you know, parents get together, maybe carpool? Because, it, listen, it is... To drive, to drive from Liverpool to Burnley four times a week, three times a week, an hour each time, an hour and a half, it's a huge yeah. ask. Especially when people have been in school all day, especially when mum and dad have been in work all day, and then you've got to go and play on the weekend as well. It's massive, but it's, it's, massive. But it's, it's like what we talked about, about the 10,000 hour theory, isn't it? And we'll probably get on to that in a minute. I mean, we can go right into it right now, um, if you I want to. I I've, got my, I've got my I own. I hope I answered that question. I hope I, I, hope I touched on it. Yeah, and I think I think later, um, well, like talking about the financial, is it, is it a do we are we concerned about a family fin financial status when we're looking for talent? Um, like Noah has set up a really great program here, which I think he'll bring in later to talk about. Um, but uh, like we'll get to that in about maybe five ten minutes. I kind of want to talk more about the ten thousand hours and like your thoughts about that, um, and then. And then if you could link it to a question about like late developer athletes. So, um, and then, you know what, I'm just going to let you go just to see where I you go with that. This one. I was waiting yeah. for that. That's a effect. I knew you were going to bring that one in. <laughs> um, so we touched on the 10,000 hour theory the other day and we were saying, you know, 
the, the myth that the talent code is it's 10,000 hours to be a professional at anything is what they're saying. It's an average of 10,000 hours. I wouldn't say it's what the English academies adhere to. It's yep. definitely something that's, that's in their thoughts, though. Hence why we train so much. It was something that was said in a meeting last week what you guys were discussing about overtraining. I definitely think there's, there's an element of overtraining. I think there can be a little bit of overkill. I think, you can, I think you can get players, especially when they're sitting eating their tea in the car, you know, eating their dinner in the car, which, which happens. Some players don't want to do that. Some players don't want to come home from school and, you know, and train three, four times a week. Yeah. It's, it, it is really difficult, but the reason why they do train four or five hours a week and then play a game on a weekend is to try and get to these 10,000 hours. Yeah. And it's like we had talked about it earlier, the 10,000 hours the concept um, is about deliberate practice, deliberate focused. Um, and you, like your, your sole intent is to improve in that skill, whatever it is. Um, I think what we were talking with Perry Cocking the other day, um, and he was talking a lot about the importance of free play and how you can still get a lot of touches on the ball and, and you can get that skill development, but it doesn't have to be so hyper-focused. Um, because when you're younger, maybe you don't like, like you said, maybe you just, you don't have that focus or you don't want to, but you can still get the, you can still train. And then as you get older, you kind of lead into it. Like you grow into more of a deliberate practice. What are your thoughts kind of on that? So do you want to meet time at Manchester United? We would go up and visit the, the, the advanced centre. So we'd have our own development centre in Merseyside. And then we would go and see the advanced centre where the, the, the top players would play. Mm-hmm. And I remember going up the first time watching there and the kids were just playing. 3v3, 2v2, no coaching. Literally minimal, minimal coaching interaction. Yep. Slight little things. Maybe just have a little thing about this next time. Yep. Oh, really like that. What about this? And I come away from because I'm a coach going, not much interaction from them. He goes, no, no, no. It's their playground. It's all about their decisions. If they, mm. you know, how do you know that a fire's hot? You look at it. You put your hand in it and go, ah, it's hot, yeah. I won't do that again. So you, yeah. you've learned already that I won't do that again. If players make mistakes and get into situations over and over and over during that free play, they're going to be better decision makers up there initially. And these are going to get better as well because they're yeah. making their decisions quicker. I'm, I'm, I'm a massive advocate for free play. I think it's, I think one night a week, maybe one and a half nights a week, it should just be, off you go, boys. There's four bibs. Go and pick a team, you go and pick that, and you go and play, and you make all the decisions. And then the tiniest tweaks, things like, okay, you know, let's bring the rule in. What can we do before we can score? Yeah. And the players are making the decisions. Give the players a little bit of challenge, like in the game. How many times can you, how many times can you do a give and go, like off your non-dominant foot or with this player or whatever, so they get more touches in the ball? That's kind of a thing that I, that I like to do in my coaching is you find, like, if you have a really skilled player and you're working without like a wide range, it's, oh, the really skilled player, I'm going to challenge you to work with this less skilled players. And then it gives them something to focus on and to grow through. And I it think it's a really valuable tool. It's a brilliant yeah. measure for me when I was at Burnley. I, I was really good. It was great for me because the head of foundation was probably one of my best friends as well. So yeah. he was like great for me bringing the players in because he just, every time I'd say, I'm bringing a good player in, it was like, okay. And then cool. we would get together and things like the free play sessions, it would be like, I would say to them, put this little stipulation in for him and let's see what he's like decision making wise. And yeah. it's just a great measure to go, oh, he can, he's, he can make this decision. He's actually a good player. And yeah. He's actually really good. He's on par with some of our boys decision making in our group. So, uh, yeah, massive advocate for free play. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a real powerful tool. Absolutely. I'm just jump in. I've got a few, oh, few little bits and pieces just to, to, to bring to it. Tom, um, Real big one with with uh, aspirations of, of um, going to the next level is not succeeding. So go for a trial at a club, you don't get taken. Um, <laughs> Jennifer spoke on Monday about the mindset and, and dealing with rejection and, and these things. Um, in your opinion, how how is that managed within within this process? So a player's keen, they come to your club, they come on trial they are not successful in the trial. How's that process managed? How do you encourage the player to, to carry on? First thing I would do, I believe the player was good enough, I'd bring every single club around us and recommend them. Every single club. Preston North End were great. I'd literally ring Andy Livingston at Preston and he'd have the player in the next night. He just went, yeah, I'll bring them in, no problem. 
pre-academy level, which is massive when you don't get that initial first contract, you know, it could be devastating for a boy. I, I, the first thing I would say to a player, if we were releasing that player, is would you like me to contact any other clubs? Yep. 99.9% of the time, then players would say, yeah. I've, I've probably had a lot of success at other clubs giving them players as well, because I just always thought it was an important thing. You know, you should never close the door to a player ever, ever, because, Jace, they might go on a different development path. They might go to Accrington Stanley down the road and, and they might do this. And in a few years' time, when you've got that ability to maybe bring them in, they remember that you did that a few years ago and they, they want to come back and, you know, that they're an actor, uh, they come in and, and strengthen your group or they're actually, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, an asset to your football club. You know, you just never know what happens in football along the line. If you, if you turn your back on these players, it's something you just definitely can't do. You've always got to keep the door open for them. And I guess a great example would be he's kind of taken himself out of England recognition, but Jamie Vardy was that player that didn't make it at an early age, got rejected by his club, went back through, played, still loved the game, played through the non-league environment, come back in through into the professional environment and ended up winning the Premier League and, and representing England. So sometimes you can see that rejection early on, but then equally you go again and you come through the system and you keep going. I think so it's what? just... Um, just one thing on that, and you said it earlier, Tom, was that sometimes clubs have different philosophies, and maybe at that time you have you're just you don't fit into what the picture of a player that they want to see, and as a player, it doesn't devalue you. I mean, you can just flip it and say, "Listen, you said no to me, like you don't want me on your team. I'm just going to prove you wrong," and then you just find another way. Which I think, I think as a like as a player, that's really it's a really important thing to like to go through those experiences to say, hey, listen, I'm just going to show to you that I'm actually better than this other person who you thought was a really successful athlete or whatever. What's not right for one club might be right for another. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and they might come into our club and, you know, and it could be this far away where it's like not quite there. We haven't really got the time to develop yet. But if you go down the road to Blackpool or, you know, or Preston North, right. then you could go there and be a really important player for them. It, Absolutely. I, I would always... Always, always do it. Even if a brother's playing for six weeks and, you know, they were a great kid and, and they weren't quite for Burnley, I always found a different football club. Always done it. Just always thought it was good practice. Yeah. So, Tom, just leading on from that, we've got a, a question from, from Jordan and it's what research fuels your philosophy on, on talent development? So, from a research point of view, from an influential point of view of, of, of key personnel as well. Very different to two different clubs, Chase. Burnley more fueled at just trying to get good players with, with, with potential, potential in because you just never know. It's ever, it, it could be, you know, Sean Dyche might not be there forever. So for you to try and recruit players that look like a first team player, well, by the time it's ready for them to come through, there's a different manager in there. There's a German manager in there who wants to play off from the back and have a high press and everything else. So we didn't recruit that way. We were a little bit but we would tend to look for just good footballers. Norwich, totally different. Predominantly led by Stuart and by Daniel. And they, they, they develop their philosophy and we just have to stick to that. They have a criteria of what a player looks like. There's an element of, we don't just look for good footballers, we look for Norwich footballers. We have a budget that we have to work to. We're never going to go and spend £10 million on a player. We're going to go and spend £1.5 million on a player, develop them, and then we're going to try and sell them for £25 million. That's our model. That's how we work. I haven't influenced my philosophy on the players. At the younger age groups, it was just something that yeah, you had to do. You, you were competing with all them clubs around you. So you had to go and do your best to get them, them best players into the environment. And then the coaches would mould them into sort of what the club wanted. Great. It was never sort of nailed down a little bit after you went, Chase. There wasn't really a sort of criteria of what, what a Burnley player looked like. Whereas at Norwich, we know what Norwich players look like. You know exactly. I'm, I'm a prime example. I'm watching a Danish second division game this morning, and I'm putting a centre midfielder forward who is a Norwich player, one thousand percent, because he looks exactly what we look for. Ticks yeah. the boxes what we look for in a, a, a centre midfielder for Norwich. Yeah. I say different in younger players. So I guess then, for for the scouts, how you would predominantly assess your talent identification philosophy is important, but you're kind of, by the club that employs you, you've got to adopt their kind yeah. of uh, 
uh, philosophy and vision. And, and I know you mentioned our time at Burnley. We had a very difficult kind of um, transition because we had Eddie Howe as the first team manager who was very expansive, very um, it, it, players were creative and, and wanted to express themselves technically. And then Sean come in and, and um, both extremely uh, effective coaches and managers, but Sean's style of play and, and, and um, type of player was very different. So yeah. what fed down into our academy is we had a huge transition one day we were looking at, at, at technical players that played in a certain way. And then we changed 24 hours later to uh, a, a way that was very different. So for you, that must've been a challenge because whatever Tom Reeves believes, we've got to work under this regime and then very quickly it changed to this regime. So that must be a challenge. Um, a real huge conversation that I had um when the next academy manager came in, it was my very first, it was my second intake. So I'd done a pre-academy intake the year before. We took 10 boys. That was what I believed in. 10 for seven play, and then we'll slowly add to the group either release players or strong grassroots players. Lewis Craig was on board. Brilliant. Second year, John wanted 20. We're, we're Burnley Football Club. Where were we going to get 20 players that good in the North West? It didn't, it didn't exist. That wasn't part of my philosophy. My philosophy was 10. We bring 10 in and then we slowly build. Unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't a good conversation. It was, where, where do you think we're going to get 20 players from that are going to be at this, this level? And it, it doesn't exist because you've got Preston North Ends, you've got Blackpool competing with these players, you've got Atkinson Stanley competing with these players, you've got Berry, you've got Oldham. You know, these clubs can give them being one of 10. Why would they want to come in and be one of 20? wasn't wasn't something that I agree with I, I wasn't I didn't want to it's a real big thing that's been it talked about bringing in mass if you're Manchester United you can take 30 players on Jay because they've got so many pitches that you know 21 players can play at once while three guys wait to get their game time we couldn't do that apparently we had, we had one pitch for seven yeah. players so it, it was a, a real eye-opener for me that you know if I was able to go back into doing the major group so I, I literally it would be 10 players, 10, 12 max, max. So are you saying, time? I guess what you're saying there is, is that's, that's quality, not quantity, which is really... Exactly. Yeah. It's something I'm massive on, yeah, massive on. Tom, I just want to pick up, you and Alana mentioned earlier about um, uh, supporting parents and, and the role of parents in this. Uh, one of the big things, that, and look, without mentioning names, you recruited a very, very young player, I think eight years old from the Liverpool area to come into Burnley mm -hmm. uh, six, seven years ago, whenever it was. That player now is still at Burnley, but I believe he's representing England under 15s. Yeah. How do you encourage or how do you help manage expectation being a, a standout player at a young age progressing through four, five, six years later, he's now representing the national team at under-15s. How, how do you manage the expectation? How do you keep that, that player grounded? How do you support the family to not start thinking that they've got a, uh, a Wayne Rooney on... on, on <laughs> a Jason Blake, if you will. A Jason Blake, yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the real great things about, about that player, Jason, is he's got an unbelievable support mechanism behind him because his dad's played the game. So he just gets it. And, you know, his, his attitude to improve and be the best player is amongst, if not the best I've seen in a young player. If he doesn't go on and play for Burnley's first team in the next three years, I'd be very, very surprised. I, I, I can actually see him being the youngest debutant, Jay, because he's that determined to do it. And if he isn't, it's because he's gone to another, you know, he's gone to another big club. So <sighs> if, if he didn't have that strong support network, work with his, his father was a, an ex-professional himself. How would you encourage the family and, and that whoever surrounds that player to, to manage expectation, to not over pressurize the player with expectations? It's, it's similar to what I was saying about the drop off at the gate thing. I mean, I would always have a good conversation with the parents. So on the first night I'll bring them in, we do, we do the paperwork, the player would go out and train. I'd introduce them to a group and I'd have, I'd have a chat to the parents, feel the parent, I'll see what they were like. And it'd be a big thing, I would say. You know, they're here, they're here to be coached. There's a reason why that coach is over that side there because he's an experienced member of staff. Yeah. Even little things like that, though, Jason, about recruiting as well. I always look at the parent beforehand as well. You're not just scouting the player, you're scouting the parents as well. Is he shouting from the sideline? Is he giving them a good encouragement? 
the first couple of weeks is always something as well. I always made it a thing where if I brought a player in on trial, I'd always try and go to the first two games and I would watch the player, the, the, the parents' behaviour as well. Are the ones who just come in and let them, let them go and play? Are the ones who are going to bark from the sideline? I've had a good mixture of both, Jace, where I've had to have them conversations and go, look, we haven't brought them to this environment for that. Like, we're taking them away from that environment because you want to give them this so we can be this good. If, if you want your boy to be the best he can possibly be, you literally need to just drop him off of the gate, stand over there and clap when he does well. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It's difficult sometimes, Chase, because I haven't got children on my own. So for me to give to give advice to people who brought these kids up and sit in the car for an hour to drive them and let them have the tea in the car, it's really difficult. Yeah. I think what that shows from you, Tom, is I think that shows an empathy and a, a humility to know that perhaps you aren't the best voice to to guide parents when you don't have a child. And um, I think that, that that's something I respect. I think the other thing that I, I've been out of England for a couple of years now, but I believe the parental education that clubs put on now is um, remarkable. Massive, yep. um, you, you've, just that jogged, you've just jogged me memory saying that. So that was something that I did do. I don't think you saw it in the first... So the, the, the first intake of pre-academy, I always did a PowerPoint presentation of expectations of what, what was expected, what, what it looks like to be a Burnley football player, you know, and what's expected from the parents. So it would be parents and players in together, and then we'd do a separate one. Lewis would take them outside, they would go and train. I would have the parents on my own, and I would literally go, look, this is what it takes, it's a package deal. There's no point in us having a top footballer if we haven't got a top parent as well. We, yeah. we need that package deal. And that's simple, simple as that. When you're around the place, there's etiquette. You don't come in, you don't bark from the sidelines. We understand some of you just sitting in the car. We get it. But you're benefiting from outstanding coaching in a, yeah. in a great facility with a chance of your child going on and being a professional footballer in six, seven years. Did it the second time as well. It, it did get a good response. To be fair, it got parents on, on the side really, really well. Um, well the, I forgot I actually did that. I did do that twice, yeah. Yeah, it just brings parents into the process because... They're, like they, the kids don't develop on their own and they're not in isolation. We want to include them in everything that we do. So let's tell them what we expect of the team and our team doesn't just end at the white lines. It actually extends beyond that into the whole family and just bringing everyone into the fold. I think it demonstrates that the sport is just bigger than what is happening with that one player, that we want everyone to grow through it and just bring them into that process. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we we're almost hitting the hour mark, so I'm just going to summarise one last thing you said, Tom. I made a note of it earlier. Is, is There's two things you said. One, you said all players are different yeah. and there's no golden rule um, in terms of scouting and um, there's, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of methodology. Um, I think that's really important to understand that a, a talented or a high-potential six-year-old doesn't mm. necessarily mean they're going to go on and become a, a professional. And... You know, there was a question about late developers. You know, again, sometimes it takes players time to 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 develop and, and be seen. So um, I think that's a really important one. And just one from my experience, I, I worked at, at Southampton um, in the Premier League and in, in the under 10s age group that I coached um, a few years ago now. Um, and that might crop up tomorrow when, when we speak to the professional player we have coming in tomorrow. Um, there were three players in my under 10s back then that have gone on to play for England in the same under 10s group. If you'd have said to me back then about those three players playing for England, I could never have predicted it. Not because they were bad or good or whatever they were, but they were nine years old. How do we know if a nine-year-old is going to be good enough to go and play for England? Yeah. So I think what they look like at seven, eight, nine years old doesn't necessarily guarantee what they're going to look like when no. they get up. I think the pressure that can be put on players that might be deemed as, as stars at that age or the ones that, oh, they're, they're not very good. It's not a straight journey of development. And I think that makes a scout's job very, very difficult. So I hugely respect what you do and, and how successful you've been uh, from what we've seen in the players we know at Burnley and, and what you're doing now with Norwich around the first team environment. So... Um, Tom, I just want to wrap up my part by saying I really appreciate you coming in. Um, appreciate you taking your time uh, to, to give us this insight and share with, with our community in Canada. Um, been great to catch up with you again. Been great. We've had some great chats this week as well. And, and it's been a great 
great kind of uh, sounding board for me on many things that we've got coming forward with the dome coming soon. Um, so your insight's been valuable to me. Alana, thanks very much. I'm going to hand back over to you and I know Noah's sure. going to come back in in a second. Yeah. If Noah's paying attention, he would just come in right now. I guess we'll just, <laughs> there he is, the main man. Um, no, any, any thoughts or insights that you kind of want to share with us? Maybe questions for Tom as we wrap it up? Yeah, no questions. I, I'm predicting, Tom, you're going to be a GM or a president of a club someday. I hope so. Like you're, you're, on, the, you're on that track, man. Um, you guys, thank you so much. This, I hate to have favorites. It's kind of like kids, right? Like, let's be honest. You don't oh. have a favorite, but you have temporary favorites. And so far, <laughs> of all these sessions, but uh, I had high, high expectations for this one, and you guys delivered. So uh, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Noah. A few, a few things, Tom, just so you would know, because I do think, and I can see you actually being here um, and, and checking things out. I know you and Jay have a great relationship, but a couple of things you mentioned that stood out to me because it's a bit of my story, and it's something that we stand for here is one, um, I loved what you said about we don't care about the financial background of a player no. and as someone that saw it firsthand like the last olympics we had north korea there right with u.s athletes russian athletes right and all the the drama going on in the world and everything just stopped for two weeks for the sake of sport right so sport is one of the few things that we have in this world that actually can bring people together that have major differences and the way that things are going right now in certain sports is they're becoming an upper class or an, uh, an upper middle class game, which creates a division that is not good. And so one of our, our things here um, and all our shareholders and, and our whole teams are behind this is we don't turn down athletes for financial reasons. We will find a way that kids can come and train with us. And that's something that we stand for. It's, it's, it's one of our in-house pillars. And so I just loved what you said about that because – um, there are some underdog athletes that have chips on their shoulders that will make the best athletes, right? And there's nothing wrong with the kid that comes from a wealthy family that's a great family that supports them. There's nothing wrong with that. But for us to dismiss kids on financial reasons is just, it's, it's, foolish. how do we, how do we, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors and why them, why it's financially different. How do we not know that that's the kid's ignition? Mm -hmm. That could be his absolute starting point to be, I've got to be this pro because I will look after my family. So how dare we? not take that into consideration and go well you know we could give him that that could be his thing that he's always thinking about going if i do this i could you know i could look after mom you know it could be a single parent who you know she does the best for me possibly do as i say ma massive thing that i don't think i've ever ever taken into consideration um and, and i've done all i can to get players up there car share and you name it yeah. if i could get them up there myself you know trying to put the minibus on whatever i could to get them players to do within the hour it's difficult, but you, you do it. You, you do the best you can do. That's awesome. Um, and then and just to close, too, I, you know, the, the whole point of this week was to show how much goes into proper athletic development. And no one in the world is going to say that they have the, the special recipe, right? But we do know that there are certain non-negotiable, what we call pillars to athletic development. Um, and – you know, so we, we already talked about the mental side of it. We talked about the physical. We talked about the technical, tactical. Um, today, your, your message to me as a scout of what you're looking for is character. Because, again, at six years old, how the heck can you predict what this kid's going to do, right? You're looking – everything you said, you're looking at these things that fall under, like, high character. Is this kid coachable? Does he listen? How does he deal with adversity? All these things. And that is the most important, in my opinion, and, and um, something that I've seen firsthand as an athlete that was always the bubble athlete and the late bloomer, quite frankly, was that I did end up making some teams because whatever, a coach thought I was coachable or I was willing to be a team guy. And so it's something that we really, really want to help our dome athletes understand. And we'll, whether they go on to play pro in the English Premier League or not, mm -hmm. it's going to help them in life. It's going to help them get a job. It's going to help them. And so thank you so much because you, you highlighted that like brilliantly and, and, um, and you're a scout for in arguably the best league in the world, right? And you're looking at character essentially. So if you want to elaborate on that quick, if not, 
we can close. I think it's a massive thing. You know what? Listen, I didn't play pro myself. Uh, I, I was a real good amateur, and and I look for what I was as well. That was what I was. I was a good listener. I was a real good trainer, and I made other players play well. That that was what I always did. I sat in the middle of the park, and I just kept the ball, and and that was me. But I allowed other players to play well, and I have a little bit of a soft spot for the, these kids who do that. And I think that they deserve. Listen, you, you, especially in the UK, the amount, of, and you probably see it in your sport as well, the amount of kids who've got this big chip on the shoulder, and I'm going to be a pro, and I'm going to be this, and then we end up doing what? Nothing. It's yeah. always the ones that the ones who the. Jason said it before. He never thought they'd go on and play for England, but I bet you there were three really good kids. I bet they were all really well behaved. I bet they all listened. I bet they, they trained really hard. You said character, massive thing. Huge thing. Yeah. In some kids, in I'll jump in on that. We can, we I will can jump in on that. Football. Yeah, Tom, you're absolutely right. One of those players was James Ward Prowse. Ah, and you know, you know. Nine years old was incredible for a young a young man. Um, and he's gone on to Southampton, captain the side, captain England under 21s, played for the national team. Um, I think over 250 appearances for the first team. And every time you see him play, that character is, is it just comes out of, of everything he does on the field. He, so, he leads, he leads. Yeah. And I would argue, guys, that we can't expect kids to just have that all figured out. And that's part of what good coaches do, yep. right? It's, you know, when they, when they make a mistake or when they're not a team guy or when, when the game turned about them, you teach them, you walk them through it. Hey. No, 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 right? And so you have to learn that. You have to learn how to be a good teammate. You have to learn all these things. But that takes you so far in the game. I don't care what sport it is. And then even further in life when, you know, when your time is done in your sport, right? So, Tom, thank you so much. Alana, great job. Jason, thank you again for this whole idea that you brilliantly put together. Um, athletic development is the main thing that, that – Everyone at the Dome is passionate about it. It's what drives us. That's why we built this building. Um, and we're super, super excited to have the resources that we have, you know, with the guy like you, Tom, to come in and, and just share your expertise and knowledge with us. And so uh, on behalf of the Dome and Central Alberta and, and soccer in Central Alberta, like, thanks so much for, for helping us. Seriously. Yeah. Nah, thanks very much for having me. Alana, thank you very much. Cheers for the conversation. Anytime, Tom, we can chat. Anytime you want. <laughs> Jace, thanks very much. And Tom, we do have a couple diamonds in the rough here, just so you know, and you'll be hearing about them. I'm telling you. I, I said to Jace, I was very, very fortunate to come out to Toronto last year. I was invited out, and I was absolutely blown away by how good the talent was, and I'm very, very sure that you guys will have some talent there as well. Ne needles and haystacks, we'll call them. Needles and haystacks. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thanks very much, you too. You too. Tom, don't...